final talk. And we have our, our last speaker, and probably statistics, Professor Mirko Chinsky from Georgia Tech. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I probably, uh, uh, I am speaker number 200 to say that, uh, you know, it's a great honor to speak at ICM. So I will be talking about the problem of uh, asymptotically efficient estimation of smooth functionals of uh, covariance operators in, high dim in a high dimensional setting. It's uh, a special case of more general problems that I will maybe describe now. So the uh, problem is uh, that you have, uh, say, NIAD observation sampled from some, uh, uh, from some distribution with parameter, uh, param some distribution P theta with parameter theta, where theta is a subset of a linear norm space. And uh, 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 it will be assumed that this linear norm space is either infinite dimensional or, uh, or high dimensional with dimension uh, that is allowed to grow with the sample size at certain rate, okay? I'm not going to be as ambitious as uh, Andrea, and uh, I'm not necessarily going to assume that the dimension is of the same order as sample size, but it will be, say, bounded by n to the power alpha for some alpha larger than zero, okay? So uh, uh, actually, as soon as dimensions start growing, you already started losing something. You are losing rates of convergence, you know, and uh, things like this, okay, in estimation problems. Uh, so I will be interested not that much in estimation of the parameter as a whole, but rather an estimation of some, uh, trying to identify some features, some characteristics of the parameter, some low dimensional features that uh, can be estimated uh, with fast rate, okay? By fast I mean just classical rate in parametric statistics, so square root of n rate. So instead of estimation, uh, instead of bad estimation, of the whole parameter, I will try to estimate really nicely uh, some uh, features, and these features will be represented uh, typically by, sm by smooth functionals on the parameter space, okay, by smooth functionals on the parameter space, so and the goal will be to estimate the value of this functional at that known parameter. Now, if you are more ambitious, you can even think about uh, estimating these uh, values of the, of the smooth functional in, um, in uh, efficient way, and by efficiency typically uh, what is meant is uh, certain properties of the estimator that include uh, normal approximation, so asymptotic normality of the estimator properly normalized, in this case with square root of n and with some variance parameter, and this asymptotic normality should hold uniformly in the parameter space or in, uh, uniformly in some proper subsets of the parameter space, say. And uh, it's needed not only for uh, distribution functions, say, but also for uh, some risks associated with some losses. For instance, if you put here a quadratic loss, you would want, uh, want it to get close to one, say, here, right? To get close to one uniformly in the parameter space. And then another element of the definition is uh, that, uh, that you want to have some asymptotic minimax lower bounds that shows essentially that uh, the estimation you constructed is optimal. So if you have one here in the limit, right, you should, uh, should show that no other estimator in the asymptotic sense is going to, you're, you're going to get better constant, right? So it means optimality both uh, from the point of view of rate and convergence and from the point of view of limit variance. Uh, okay, so the, the notion of asymptotic efficiency, of course, is not new. It's a very old notion, uh, about 100 years old. It was uh, in introduced by Fisher, and uh, it was introduced in some sense prematurely, because uh, at that time not only statistics but even probability theory still was a few years away becoming, you know, fully rigorous mathematical subject, okay? So Fisher not only uh, actually was not able, uh, he came up with very ambitious program of showing that maximum likelihood estimators that he was developing uh, would be asymptotic efficient, but his definition, uh, the, the way he posed the problem and the way he was trying 
to solve it, uh, actually had no chance, okay? And uh, his uh, program failed after the discovery of counterexample of super efficient estimators, but then uh, sometime later it was uh, resurrected, okay? And uh, rather nice uh, new definitions of asymptotic efficiency and rather nice series that you can read now in graduate textbook on statistics, right? Advanced graduate textbook on statistics emerged primarily in the work of Lecam and Hayek. Okay, and one of the consequences of this consequences of this theory is that in in regular finite dimensional statistical models, if you want uh, to estimate a smooth function of parameter, smooth function of parameter, then it's enough just to plug in a maximum likelihood estimator in the function, and you are already getting a symptotically efficient estimator. Okay, which would have optimal uh, in this minim asymptotic minimax sense will have optimal convergence rate and optimal limit value. Okay, so in, from this point of view, the problem is solved, but uh, the problem becomes considerably harder when the parameter is either infinite dimensional or uh, high dimensional, right? When the dimension is allowed to grow. In this case, first of all, uh, fairly often you are losing square root of n rate, even for simple functionals, you can lose rate, okay? Not always it holds. Okay, uh, in this case you need to figure out what the optimal rate is going to be. You can lose, uh, e even if uh, square root of n rate is attainable, uh, the, the construction of efficient estimator is completely non-trivial in this case, and rather rarely you would just plug in maximum likelihood to get a symptotically efficient estimator. So th this problem has been studied over the years, first in non-parametric setting, more recently there are some attempts to approach, to, to move in this direction in the case of high dimensional models uh, by a number of people, okay, for a number of years. I'm not, uh, I don't have time to explain, you know, in any detail uh, uh, all these results. I will uh, talk a little bit about one old paper. It's paper written in the late 80s. And it's, uh, a pay, uh, I, I'm talking about this paper because it's, uh, 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 it's uh, kind of especially close to the approach I am trying to develop, okay, just, just for this reason. So it's uh, a paper by Ibrahimov, Hasminski, and Nemirovsky. Uh, Nemirovsky is now my colleague at uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, this is probably the only paper three of them wrote together. Uh, 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 these two guys collaborated for years, but th this was the only case when they wrote a paper with Nemirovsky. And uh, Nemirovsky later continued working on this in the 90s, okay, did some uh, follow-up work. So basically what they were looking at, they were looking at um, uh, Gaussian white noise model, so the, the unknown parameter is a signal from some set theta in L2, and this signal is observed in Gaussian white noise with, uh, you know, the noise is rescaled by one over square root of n, so when n is large, the noise becomes small, and this is the asymptotic we are trying to study. The complexity of the parameter space was uh, characterized by Kolmogorov diameters, so by the accuracy, basically, of approximation of the parameter space by finite dimensional subspaces, or Kolmogorov vitzes, whatever way you call it, it's both are imperfect translation of Russian word papirichnik. Okay, so it's uh, kind of this both terms, okay? So uh, uh, under the assumption that Kolmogorov diameters decay as m to the power minus beta for some beta larger than zero, what they wanted to do, they wanted to find a threshold on smoothness of a functional f uh, such that efficient estimation of f of theta with square root of eight is possible uh, when the smoothness is above the threshold and when the smoothness is below the threshold, you know, you typically are losing given rate square root of n, and uh, these rates are becoming slower, okay? So uh, it turns out that the even uh, to define smoothness correctly in this problem is not uh, completely trivial because uh, you can look at such functional as square of the, of the L2 norm, which is as smooth, you know, in normal sense as uh, it could be, but already when uh, the Kolmogorov diameters decay, decay with rate beta, which is smaller than one quarter, you could not estimate it with square root of n rate, okay? There are no estimators with square root of n rate. Uh, 
uh, that's why, you know, they, they came up with a rather tricky definition of smoothness. They, well, to define smoothness, you need to look at uh, something like Hölder norm, and then uh, you, you need to measure in some way the norms of the derivatives. The derivatives are multilinear forms, so you can put various forms, uh, various norms on multilinear forms. You can take supremum over unit ball of the centuries, and you will get operator norms, say. Or you can uh, also use Gilbert Schmidt norms. Norms, and you can use some hybrids of Hilbert Schmidt and uh, operator norm, taking, say, Hilbert Schmidt norm with respect to some entries, this entries being fixed, and then souping out the rest of the entries, right? And, uh, this is what, uh, more or less, what they did. They defined uh, a norm like this, uh, that, uh, that they used actual, actually on all derivatives up to the order k minus 1 Hilbert Schmidt norm, then on case derivatives there was hybrid norm, and then uh, uh, they also needed some Hölder condition on the last derivative, and this was done in operator norm, in usual operator norm. So it's a mixture of everything. And with this rather complicated definition of smoothness, they basically were able to identify threshold for smoothness that, that, that guarantee the possibility to have efficient estimation and constructed efficient estimators in this case. Uh, in, a, in a later work, Nemirovsky, with, with considerable effort actually using rather subtle uh, information theoretic arguments, was able to prove that these thresholds are sharp. So you could not improve them in the sense that you can always find bad uh, functional or flower smoothness such that it could not be estimated with square root of n rate. Okay? And uh, the construction of efficient estimator is actually very nice in this paper. It's, uh, you know, kind of, uh, they reduce the problem to unbiased estimation of Hilbert Schmidt polynomials and then they use rather nice. Uh, nice complexification of the space and then uh, properties of harmonic functions in order to con construct uh, unbiased estimator. In this case, that happens to be efficient for polynomial, and then they use this technique in order to construct efficient estimators for smooth functions. Okay, uh, I, am, uh, I was interested in uh, studying similar problems in the case of uh, covariance estimation, when the unknown parameter is not mean, but rather covariance, and in this case, the problem the problems are, are uh, much harder, actually, to deal with. And I was not able to fulfill this program in the same generality as in the case of Ibrahimov with Kaspinsky. I, 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 am able, I am able to do it now for some class of smooth functionals. I'm not aware of uh, a, a, any work where, where efficient estimation was done. Uh, there has been attempts, many attempts, to construct asymptotically normal estimation estimators in high-dimensional setting for various functionals. And uh, there, are, there is beautiful work on uh, asymptotic, uh, on central limit theorem for linear, uh, linear spectral statistics and random metric theory with some connection to this topic. But uh, this, uh, this is not really. This thing is not really an est uh, a good estimator of, 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 of the trace of f of sigma in this case, so uh, these results cannot be directly applied to the problem I am talking about. And uh, finally, you know, very recently in our joint paper with Loeffler and Nickel, we studied, um, uh, we constructed efficient estimators for linear functionals of principal components of eigenvectors, right, in some high dimensional setting. And, uh, but in this case, the method was very, very specific to this pro problem, and it's not a general method cannot be applied in more generality, and this is what I was interested in. Okay, so now the problem I will be looking at is this. You have IA, the data consists of IID observations and IID observation of uh, a Gaussian vector with mean zero and uh, covariance sigma. It will be in, in, in a finite dimensional space in RD, and then uh, given a smooth uh, function in real line, uh, you first apply this function to covariance operator, so you are getting a function whose values is an operator now, right? Just, just by usual continuous functional calculus, right? And then you take a linear functional of this object, right? Linear functional of this operator, you multiply it basically by, by some operator whose uh, nuclear norm is bounded by a constant, okay? So you, you can think of such things like, for instance, matrix entries 
of this uh, operator f of sigma in some basis or uh, um, uh, more generally linear, uh, by linear forms, okay, of f of sigma. That's uh, the object that I am trying to estimate in this case. And then uh, the, the problem will be this, assuming that the dimension grows at certain rate, like not, not faster than n to the power alpha for some alpha larger than zero, my goal is to try to determine a threshold s of alpha on the smoothness of f such that when s is above the threshold, efficient estimation becomes possible, okay, with square root of n rate. Okay. So uh, I will be doing this under certain constraints on the covariance operator, and the constraint will be basically that the spectrum of the covariance will be bounded away from zero and bounded from infinity by constant. So it, you can think of it as spectrum being between a minus one and a, where a is a fixed number. Okay, and then uh, in this setting, uh, if you look at operator norm deviation of sigma hat from sigma, it will be completely characterized by the ratio of dimension and the sample size. Okay, just uh, we will have two-sided bounds in this case. Uh, and uh, so dimension is really crucial complexity parameter in this case, you know, unlike uh, what, what would be if uh, we, we did not have this assumption. Uh, now, if you take uh, just a C1 function in real line uh, and then uh, apply this to operator and look at this operator uh, function that maps, say, self-adjoint operator to f of a, uh, then it, uh, s since we are in finite dimensional case, it's going to be Frechet differentiable and there is a well-known expression for Frechet derivative in this case, right, in direction h. So it's uh, basically what it is, it's um, a, sure, a sure product of uh, this matrix, okay, that is called, defined on the spectrum of A, that is called uh, often Lovner matrix. And, uh, and matrix H uh, represented in the basis of eigenvectors of A. Okay, so if you take these two things or, or just use this formula where these are spectral projectors, okay, that correspond to eigenvalues lambda and mu. Uh, so that's the expression for the derivative, and then uh, in terms of the derivative, you can define what will be limit variance in this problem, right? So it's just the derivative multiplied on both sides by sigma to the power one half, and then you take Hilbert, square of the Hilbert Schmidt norm of this, okay? And then this is the main result uh, that I want to state. Uh, now, uh, I will assume that the dimension is allowed to grow as n to the power alpha for some alpha between zero and and one. And then uh, 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 suppose that for some s that is above this threshold, one divided by one over one minus alpha, that will be the threshold. Okay? Uh, function f belongs to best of space b s infinity one. So s is kind of best of smoothness of my function. Then, in this case, I claim that there is uh, an efficient estimator that, that will be of this form, so I apply some mapping. It's not going to be really a function in, in real line applied to, to sample covariance sigma hat. It will be some, some mapping okay, uh, applied to sigma hat. And then uh, you, you will have this uh, uh, uniform asymptotic normality properties that would allow me to claim uh, asymptotic efficiency of this estimator as soon as I have uh, minimax lower bound, and this is uh, and I have it, okay, minimax lower bound too. So uh, asymptotic minimax lower bound is proved using uh, kind of common technique in this type of problems, one thing's inequality from one of the information lower bound uh, that are often used for these purposes. It's a kind of relatively standard thing, but the construction of estimator is uh, much more complicated, okay? So to explain this, first, you know, let me briefly comment why best of smoothness appears here, why not say Hölder smoothness, okay, in, the, in this type of problems. It has to do with some uh, operator series that has to be used to study this problem. Namely, a lot depends on the uh, on the bounds on uh, on the remainders of Taylor expansions. In this case, it's first-order Taylor expansion for operator functions like this. Okay, 
like the one that I am considering, and I need this bounds in operator norm, so both uh, the size of the remainder of Taylor expansion, for instance, and the norm of the perturbation should be measured in operator norm. I also needed bounds of this type, for instance, uh, in order later to use this to, to prove some concentration inequalities for the remainder and things like this. And uh, there is a line of work in operator theory that deals with this type of problems, in particular it's related to some long-standing problems in, uh, you know, posed by Crane in the 60s uh, about uh, um, uh, showing uh, whether, whether when you, uh, you know, if you have a Lipschitz function in real line and then apply it to operator and have some norms on the operator, like um, operator norm or nuclear norm or general Schatten-P norms, whether the resulting, uh, the resulting function of operator will be Lipschitz again, okay? That's a, a well-known line of work with some quite non-trivial problems, and uh, for uh, operator norm, actually, uh, for instance, for, to, to have this operator Lipschitz property, Lipschitz property would not be enough. You, you, you would need to put your function in some best of space, okay, of smoothness one in this case, right? And to, to have bounds on the remainder, you can use similar techniques that people use in this area based on little wood Pele decompositions of F and some uh, operator versions of Bernstein inequalities from complex analysis in order to, to, der to, to derive this type of bounds, and I used this a lot, actually, in this project, had to use this a lot. Now, the uh, next question will be this, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, look at the first question you might ask, in which, in which cases the, uh, the plug-in estimator, when you just plug in ma maximum likelihood estimator, which in this case is sample covariance, right, would give you, uh, would be efficient, right? In which case uh, plug-in estimator is enough. Uh, well, uh, you can easily write first order Taylor expansion, right, for, for plug-in estimator like this, and then you will uh, easily see that the linear term of this first order expansion already has correct order and correct variance that you need to get according to the lower bound. So the only way for plug-in estimator to work is to make remainder smaller than n to the power minus one half, asymptotically negligible. And this happens exactly when uh, the, the smoothness S is above the threshold we need and alpha is between zero and one half. So when dimension grows slower than one half, you don't need anything else. You can use plug-in estimator like in, 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 in classical setting, right? Nothing else is needed. Uh, uh, this is also the case when the bias of plug-in estimator estimator is uh, asymptotically negligible. Okay. Now, uh, you, one might think that uh, maybe this is because, uh, you know, the, that the bounds may be a bit rough because you are replacing li bound on linear function all by these norms, but this is not the case. The bounds actually are sharp in this case, and you, you, you just, uh, when, when dimension becomes smaller than n to the power of one half, even for very generic, simple, smooth functional, the bias is going to be large. Okay. That's the problem in the, uh, here. Okay, the bias is large, but uh, asymptotic normality property holds uh, for plug-in estimator if you center it with its own expectation, with correct variance and with correct rate, uh, as soon as dimension is smaller than n. Okay, that's enough, right? So plug-in estimator is a good estimator of a wrong object in this case, right? Of its own expectation rather than of the function we are trying to estimate. Uh, this is proved by, uh, uh, by again, using first-order Taylor expansion. And in this case, since you centered uh, this thing with expectations, the remainder becomes centered. And this allows you to use uh, on centered remainder Gaussian concentration inequality. Okay, and using Gaussian concentration inequality, you can show that the remainder becomes so small of n to the power minus one half as soon as dimension is smaller than n. Okay, so in this, from this point of view, you know, plug-in estimator concentrates well, but in the wrong place. Okay, now, uh, in order to overcome this, you need to invent some bias reduction method, and this is probably the most interesting part of this work. So what, what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to, fun, to find another, uh, another function g, 
It's not, again, going to be necessarily function in real line applied to operator, just some mapping of sigma hat, such that the bias of this estimator g of sigma hat as an estimator of f of sigma will be small, but at the same time you will have proper normal, uh, normal approximation, right, for this estimator centered, centered with its expectation. So we, but we want to make the bias so small of n to the power minus one half in this case. This basically boils down to solving certain equation, to, fi to finding a proper approximate solution of certain equation, and this equation can be written in terms of this integral operator. And this uh, integral operator is, uh, you, you know, you can, you can view it as, um, uh, as an integral operator with respect to, uh, to Markov kernel, and this Markov kernel is just, just the distribution of, uh, of, of the sample covariance, the distribution of sigma hat for given sigma. Uh, this operator is common in, uh, in the theory of Vischer distribution and is used a lot. In particular, if you, we need this operator uh, to be defined on operator valued functions, but if you use it on real valued functions, uh, uh, the eigenfunctions, for instance, of this operator will be zonal polynomials that play a crucial role in, uh, you know, in these problems in multivariate uh, analysis where, uh, where uh, uh, Vischer distribution is needed. Uh, so it goes back uh, actually to very old papers by James in 61 where, who studied zonal polynomials and things like this. Uh, now, what we need, we need to find a, a, a smooth solution of this operator equation, uh, approximate solution, and uh, you can, in principle, if you introduce this operator B, which is a T minus identity, okay, which will be small as soon as dimension is smaller than N, uh, you, you can formally write the solution of this equation in terms of Neumann series, in terms basically of this, of, of this operator geometric progression. I don't, don't know and I don't care actually, I don't need any convergence of this series because what I will do, I will just take a partial sum of this series uh, given by this formula and I will need it for k that satisfies this condition, right, that depends on my smoothness, right, on the smoothness of my functional and on the number alpha, just on this. And I claim that for this choice of k, this, uh, uh, this thing is going to have small bias, is going to have small bias, and moreover, with much more effort, you can prove that it is asymptotically efficient, right? It gives us asymptotically efficient estimator. Uh, uh, so, uh, the bias of this, it's easy to see from the definition, will be expressed in terms k plus first power of this operator. So, this is what we have to study, how these powers behave. And uh, if you look again at this operator, this operator with respect to this Markov kernel, what you can do, you can uh, run Markov chain in the cone of covariance operators, and this Markov chain, this will be Markov chain with this transition probability kernel P. And this Markov chain is uh, kind of an interesting object from statistical point of view because, you know, at the beginning you start this chain with your true covariance sigma, then it jumps to sigma hat. Then at the next iteration, in order to kind of figure out where the chain will be at the next iteration, what you have to do, you have to take normal distribution with mean zero and covariance sigma hat and resample from this distribution. Take again a sample of size n, a construct, uh, what would be parametric bootstrap estimator now, right? And then you have to repeat this iteratively. So the kind of then you use, uh, use uh, uh, sigma two hat as uh, your true covariance, resample again, and just keep going like this. Okay? This will be the Markov chain, and then operator t to the power k will be just expectation of function g evaluated at this uh, chain sigma, sigma, sigma hat k at moment of time k. And uh, the chain jumps with uh, small steps, right? The steps will be controlled by square root of d over n, and I am assuming that d is smaller than n. And now, if you look at uh, operator uh, b to the power k, uh, b to the power k. This uh, o -o 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 operator can be written in terms of t using just Newton's binomial formula. And if you now uh, recall that tj of f of sigma will be expectation of f at sigma hat j, you can write it in terms of expectation of this expression, and this expression is nothing but case order difference of function f computed along the Markov chain. 
right? So then we are left basically with the following problem. If you uh, uh, consider a function uh, that is k times differentiable in real line, and then you uh, start moving in real line on the grid, right? You start at point x, then with small step move, move to x plus h, then x plus twice h, and so on. And then you have finite difference operator, and you compute case power of it, so case order difference of function f at x, right, in the, in the with step h, right? Then this will be of the order h to the power k is f is ck, right? It's kind of well known from calculus, right? Uh, and uh, the question is, when you have more complicated dynamics, when, uh, when, when you move in the cone of covariance operators with small steps, right, along this trajectory of this, what I call, bootstrap chain, whether, whether you will have a similar property and whether the, 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 uh, the size of this expectation will be of the order square root of d over n to the power k in this case, right? And the answer is yes, it will be uh, of this order. And the consequence of this is that if you uh, recall the connection between bias of estimator of k and these uh, powers of operator b, you, you will conclude that as soon as, say, k plus 1 is above this threshold and d grows like n to the power alpha, the operator norm of the bias here will be small of n to the power minus 1 half. So you're kind of getting, uh, you're removing the bias by this uh, argument, right? You're moving the bias from this argument. Uh, the proof of this fact, and this will be probably the last few slides, and I will go through them very briefly, happen to be rather hard, actually. And I, uh, I, I would be happy if someone uh, find a better proof of this. Uh, the, 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 the version of the proof I have is based on the reduction of the problem to, uh, to invariant functions on the con of of uh, covariance operator. So these are real valued functions now, and they are orthogonally invariant. And it is well known that, uh, that uh, operator T preserves orthogonal invariance properties. So uh, orthogonally invariant functions are, in fact, um, you know, form an invariant subspace of this operator, if you want. Okay, uh, then uh, the next element, uh, uh, the, the next observation that is needed, uh, we need uh, some device that would allow us to transform uh, real valued function on covariance operators into operator valued functions. And this device is, is uh, I call lifting operator here. This is this decalligraphic, and it's defined this way. You just take fractional derivative of smooth function, uh, smooth real valued function g, multiply it on both sides by sigma one half, and this gives you this decalligraphic, right? You, you lift it to operator valued function now. Uh, it, it is also uh, could be proved that for smooth orthogonally invariant function g, d commutes with t, this lifting operator commutes with t and with the powers of t. As a, as a consequence, it will commute also with the powers of b. Okay? Uh, then, uh, how we do lifting, actually? We want to say something about the size of this operator, bk of f sigma. That's what we need, right? Uh, so what we do, we try to represent function f in this form as x times the derivative of another function psi. Then uh, you, you define orthogonally invariant function as uh, function of g as trace of psi of sigma. And then when you compute this, uh, apply this lifting to g of sigma, it will give you f of sigma. As a result, uh, you can write bk of f sigma as bk uh, times dg of sigma, and then since they commute on orthogonally invariant functions, you can flip them, and then uh, from now on you can work with, with bk instead, applied to g of sigma, to orthogonally invariant functions. Now, how it works on orthogonally invariant functions? Well, it's easier to start with powers of t. Power of t can be represented this way, where w is uh, the sample covariance based on standard normal random vectors, right? Based on standard normal random vectors. And these are IID copies of w, right? Then by a very simple argument that I showed here, but probably I don't have time to explain it, right? Uh, you, you, you will get this uh, representation of tkg sigma as this expectation. Now, uh, you can also write tj, uh, or, or t to the power j of j of sigma as expectation like this, where this is arbitrary product of, uh, of uh, 
uh, of these square roots of these matrices, right, or whatever set of indices you want, but of cardinality j. Just because everything is IID, you will get also this, right, by the, by the previous slide. And now, when you look at b to the power k of g sigma, what you are doing, you are writing it again using Newton's binomial formula, you are replacing tj of g of sigma by this expectation, and then you are left with the expectation of certain alternating sum of these guys. And the last step that you have to do, you have to try to uh, find a function on the unit cube that will take uh, on uh, binary vectors, on uh, vertices of the unit cube, will take exactly these values, right? And then this expression that we had under the expectation will become uh, this expression for function phi, right, for function phi. Uh, and uh, then it's easy to recognize that this is just an application of k finite difference operators acting on each coordinate, right? And as a result, you are left with uh, this formula for BK of G of sigma at expectation of this uh, bunch of finite difference operators applied to phi, which by uh, Newton-Leibniz formula, just generalize, generalized Newton-Leibniz formula, can be written in terms of partial derivatives. Then you use and you get representation of BK of F of sigma, right? This representation is crucial here because, because without this, it's impossible to do calculus here. Now you can do calculus. You can start differentiating, and this was a real pain in the neck in this problem because this is maybe the first time in my life I, when I realized that matrices really do not commute because you, when you start differentiating these functions like this, uh, you, 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 have, you, you could not flip things, right? And you have to spread the differentiation, you know, just in some way and it was painful but it's just calculus okay with this calculus you can prove a bound on uh, on what we need on this derivative in terms of operator norm uh, differences of wi minus i and uh, then uh, ju just compute expectation of this and get the bound uh, of the order d over n to the power k over 2 because this this has the size square root of d over n okay this, uh, this is uh, sample covariance based on IID standard normal vectors, right, in D dimensions. Okay, so uh, this, this is basically, you know, the, the, the tools that are used here. There are lots of problems that are open. I'm not, uh, I do not have a rigorous proof of optimality of this threshold yet. Also, I have very strong evidence that this, this threshold is optimal. That uh, if uh, S is below the threshold, you can construct a functional that is uh, that is going to be uh, for which square root of n rate fails. Okay, is impossible. But there, there is no rigorous proof yet. But there is, you know, for some similar models, there is uh, there is a proof essentially. Okay, uh, and I, I think it will be sharp in this case. And uh, uh, some of these problems were studied recently in uh, in uh, dimension free framework, in which complexity of the problem is characterized not by dimension but by so-called effective rank of the covariance, which is more flexible way to characterize the complexity, and it's same and the K under this constraint on the covariance that I introduced, but uh, this problem I, I don't know at all how to do it and the, 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 the place where there are difficulties is exactly the, this proof that I explained to you because I'm, uh, you know, this, using these representations of, uh, already dictates me to do everything in terms of dimension. I could not uh, avoid this if I uh, uh, do it this way. Uh, uh, you, you know, why one might want to, to work with objects like this and then you need to remove constraints that the nuclear norm of operator B is bounded by one. You need to work with, uh, you know, without these constraints and there are additional difficulties in this case. Uh, of course, this class of functionals is, is, is by far not the most general, uh, general smooth functionals of covariance. It's not the same generality as, as in this result of Ibrahim of Nemirovsky as Kaspinsky for Gaussian shift model I showed. Uh, 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 of course, uh, what I can do is, uh, in fact, for more general objects, because I can do it for uh, uh, for the lifting of any uh, smooth orthogonally invariant function on covariances, right? So this uh, application of lifting operator to any, then uh, everything will work in this case too, but this is also not the, the general uh, class of smooth functionals, okay? And uh, finally, you know, if you start imposing various structural constraints on the class of covariances, like 
like spark city and things like this, you know, you immediately are getting getting different problems that can be can be hard in their own right. Uh, the, the method itself is applicable to other models, and by now it's done, for instance, for Gaussian shift model in, in a very general setting. To in my joint work with Maya Zhilova, but uh, other than this, in in some other models, it's not explored how this bootstrap chain bias reduction would work. Okay, thank you very much. I will stop here. That's, that's already late. We have time for perhaps a couple questions. Thank you. So how does it interplay with um, high-dimensional covariance estimators? Right? High-dimensional what? Covariance estimators. Uh -huh. does, it, does it matter what high-dimensional covariance estimator you use? Because uh, well, uh, uh, in, the, in the analysis that I am doing, it uh, a lot matters, okay? And I, uh, I, 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 you know, it's uh, the, the paper that I wrote on this at the moment is a technical 84 pages paper, and I am sure there might be places where, where, where changing the estimator might, uh, might require a lot Lots of effort, okay. It's, uh, but uh, it depends on the estimator. You know, for some estimators, probably I could see a path how to do it. For other estimators, I can, I can, I can see some difficulties. Okay, so. so people have spent a lot of time on the properties of these estimators. Right? Yeah, this, this, this is related to this last line that I wrote because if you if you are doing this under under more constraints on covariance, you are, are not going to start with sample covariance. You, you can start with a different estimator, like, you know, for instance, in this work of Ibrahimov, Kasminsky, and Nemirovsky, since they were on non-parametric setting, they were, they were uh, sort of improving, uh, the, the, their starting point was, uh, was uh, non-parametric estimator with optimal rate in this problem, and then they were, they, they were basically uh, using Taylor expansion of their functional around, uh, around this point, right, and uh, then uh, were replacing this Taylor approximating this Taylor function by polynomial, right? And then they had a method of efficient estimation of polynomials that they were using in this problem, right? So the starting point should be, should be you know, whatever estimator is natural here, but, uh, but it could lead to complications, of course. More questions? No, I mean, Maybe following up a bit on this, and also the last line. So you still want to achieve asymptotic normality, I guess, right? Yes, so they so, achieved so, it. So, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if it's sparse, would you all consider to do some sort of de desparsifying your uh, sigma hat so that you... Uh, no, uh, uh, in, in this setting I'm not doing anything like no, this, no, of I course. I just, I just, uh, yeah. I'm just pro proving asymptotic normality by brute force, by using yeah. the integral representations and just doing Taylor expansion and, and, and doing concentration inequality on the remainder of Taylor expansion. That's basically the way it is, okay? But, but, but I, I'm, this is about the future, In right? the so last slide. So the last line, if you stick in a sparse estimator, you're already in troubles, right? Or you need to kind of de-bias that one or de-sparsify. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I anticipate difficulties, right? I, I, I do not expect this to be, to be simple. Okay. But I anticipate difficulties, but I, I, I have not worked on this. I, 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 I tried because I had to write some grant proposal and had to outline there, you know, some approaches to this, but uh, it's only at this level, you know, for, for yeah. More questions? I have one perhaps quick question about the... Um, <coughs> Uh, the notion of uh, effective rank, right? So you'd want to make this uh, uh -huh. infinite dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, 
I mean, there, there are several parts of the argument that will probably have to change. You talked about this last one with oh, the yeah. with Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but, this this, this argument it, completely fails yeah, if you okay. use uh, the, the heuristic, okay, that, that is behind this. And everything started with heuristics that I kind of ex tried to explain to you, that you are, are kind of looking at expectation of uh, case order difference along the chain, and then uh, yeah. since the chain moves with small steps, you uh, the yeah. chain in this case also, when you when you control things by effective range, the chain still will move with small steps. So the heuristic still works, okay, but uh, justification of heuristic happened to be hard in this case, at least uh, the way I approached it. I, I, maybe it's a wrong approach, I don't know. Right, but would you still be willing to conjecture that somehow if you... I would rather you conjecture that it will be true. I think okay. it will be true, but I, 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 some new idea is needed right. to, in order to deal with this problem. Okay, so more questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.